Good morning. Welcome to Normandy Park United Church of Christ. Wherever you are on life's journey, you are most welcome here. This morning, we express our gratitude and acknowledgement of the federally recognized Muckleshoot people as we gather on their traditional land. Now, sometimes I talk about the Duwamish, but the Muckleshoot are here as well. And we recognize the Muckleshoot's continued presence as a strong, sovereign nation and their invaluable contributions to our state history, economy, and culture. Those that came before us made a decision to federally rec recognize the Muckleshoot, but not some of the other nations in this area. So we here right now hold in tension the differing histories of the first peoples of this land. And we hold in tension who the US government has recognized and who we, they have not. So let us worship our good creator this morning on this Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday. Please join me in the words of gathering. Uh, I will read the light print. Please join me in reading the dark print. Jesus asks, what are you looking for? What do we say? Jesus says, come and see. He invites us in, asks us to abide with him. A simple call, a hard call. Jesus, are you really talking to us? Yes, he is speaking to us. We have come this far to this place. Let us listen and be transformed. Let us worship our holy God. Let us pray. Holy One, you beckon to us, asking us a simple question. What is it that we are looking for? What is it that we need this day? Be with us as we try to answer that question, as we entertain your holy curiosity, as we reflect upon your invitation, your words. Be with us as we ask questions, puzzle through our doubts, 
as we seek your justice and your will. Help us to understand that we might never have all the answers and that we might feel inadequate to the task. But we do have an invitation, an invitation from you to come and see, to continue the journey, to practice what it means to follow you, to abide in you. Help us remember the legacy of Dr. King and help us to celebrate you. Amen. are Polish folk dances, and Chopin wrote dozens and dozens of them. Uh, he grew up in Poland in the early 1800s, and when he was 18, 19, he left and never went home again. Uh, he died when he was quite young at 39. But all of these dances, these Polish folk dances that he wrote, were reminiscent of where he grew up in rural Poland. And though he never got to see it again, uh, they helped remind him of that and bring that kind of character to his life when he was living abroad in very large cities. He lived a short time in Vienna and then most of the rest of his life in Paris. Uh, but these are reminders of his homeland.
litany and prayer of confession adapted from Liturgy Outside by Catherine Hawker. Again, I will read the light print. Please join me in reading the dark print. A child once dreamed the voice was calling his name, Samuel. Fishermen once heard the voice when a young man bid them follow. And still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Send me. Moses protested vehemently at the voice spoke at the burning bush. Mary stood amazed as the voice proclaimed impending birth. And still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here I am, send me. Rosa Parks followed the voice to the front of the bus. Martin Luther King Jr. heard the voice as the bullet shattered. And still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here I am, send me. The voice beckons from humble places in the tears of hungry children, in the cries of the frail and frightened elderly, in the pleas of those whose dreams have been too long deferred. And still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here I am, send me. A timid believer pauses to listen to the voice. A struggling church hears the voice and turns. And still the voice beckons today. Can you hear? Here I am, send me. Holy God, for all the times we believe that it is not us you are talking to, for all the times we look for someone else to the hard work of following you, for all the times we have not heeded your will, your call, forgive us. Amen. Words of assurance. Friends, Christ makes all things new. Christ beckons us. And each day we have the opportunity to open our hearts and minds to God's love and forgiveness. So we're going to try something new with passing of the peace. Um, you have some instructions in your bulletin, but I invite you to stand and turn and face each other. Okay, so we've got this side, window, stained glass window side, looking at the organ side. All right. And so we're going to start with the stained glass window side offering, may the peace of Christ be with you, and then the organ side saying, and also with you, and then it'll be your turn to say, may the peace of Christ be with you, and it will be the stained glass window side to, side to say, and also with you. Can we do it? Yeah. All right, let's try it. Okay. May the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. And may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Thank you. May the peace of Christ be with those of you on Zoom. Welcome to go off to Sunday school.
Sharing our sacred story comes from John chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Chosen One. The next day John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas which is translated Peter. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's uh, good to be back with a message to share with you today, and I have to say it was also good to take a Sunday off last week. A big thank you to Connie for sharing her words of wisdom and lived experience with you. Maybe some of you are curious as to what we were up to last Sunday. Well, we took a ferry to Vashon Island to have a doggy play date with an Italian water dog named Coco. You see, Coco's parents are moving to Scotland later this year and are hopeful that we might be a good second family to her. We, as a family, are practicing what Albert Einstein coined as a holy curiosity as we see how our dogs do with each other to explore if our family and this other family have a similar ethos about doggy life and, you know, care. But the main thing is, you know, really, do these dogs get along? Will they accept each other as part of the pack? As dog parents, we must watch and listen and learn from their interactions and from each other. And I have to say, I kind of wish human communication could be as clear as dog communication. It makes life so much easier. <laughs> so we are keeping our hearts and minds open as we venture into this conversation about where beloved Coco will live Come June, will she end up on a flight to Scotland? Maybe. Will she end up at our house? We rather hope so. In the meantime, we will stay curious. The thing about curiosity is, it could be just seen as nosiness, like how my dog Teddy snooped around Coco's house sniffing out all of the good smells. It's rather self-serving. And, you know, that's sometimes what we think about, you know, curiosity kills a cat. Etc. Cetera, et cetera. But a 
fully curiosity, or curiosity could be a form of active listening and a deeper engagement with a subject matter or a person. And I think Einstein was talking about the latter when he coined this phrase. And this is what he said, and I believe that he was referencing science education when he was talking about curiosity. The important thing, and this is Einstein, is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. One cannot help but be in awe when one contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery every day. Never lose a holy curiosity. Never lose a holy curiosity. When we frame curiosity and wholeness, holiness together, we invite God into the conversation. We open ourselves up to a whole universe of possibility. We may experience awe or wonder or find a new strength or compassion within ourselves that we didn't think possible as we entertain the questions. I do, be do believe that when theologians and spiritual types heard Einstein's turn of phrase, they ran with it because by the time I was in seminary, having a holy curiosity and an openness to what God might be teaching us and nudging us toward was the expectation and the rule. We weren't there just to confirm our own biases about God, religion, life, and Jesus. We were there to have our notions challenged, to have our minds expand, and hopefully our hearts too. Some evangelicals I knew when I went off to seminary in the late 90s would joke with me that seminary was actually cemetery, where all good Christianities go to die. But honestly, that wasn't my experience. The truth was I learned how rich and layered and awesome and deep and big the study of our faith is. There's just no way to contain it, just as Christ could not be contained in the tomb. Which brings me to our gospel reading today. Where I've usually been confused by this passage, and I don't know, it is kind of a confusing passage, I think. Um, this time around, I became curious about John the Baptist and his relationship to Jesus. Because in this passage, John really ought to be renamed. Instead of the baptizer, we, we could or should call him John the Testifier. That is exactly what he is doing testifying to who Jesus is, this anointed one, the Messiah. It's pretty interesting that John didn't lead with, hey, this guy's my cousin. I'm related to him. And you know, you know what? God favors him. No. Instead, he said, hey, look, I didn't know this guy, but he's the one that you've been looking for. Don't look to me. Look to him. Taken literally, it doesn't make sense that John the testifier wouldn't know his own cousin. But I wonder if John is instead saying, this guy has surprised me. He's not who I thought he was. I thought he was, you know, Jesus, just the carpenter's son. It seems to me that John employed a holy curiosity in seeing Jesus with new eyes, and he's open to the voice which says, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John remains open. He sees in a new way that Jesus is the anointed one. And he doesn't stop there. He tells what has been revealed to him to his own followers, his own students. And so, of course, the students of John stop what they're doing because now they too are curious and are paying attention. And so they go and approach Jesus as he's walking by. And, of course, it's not until verse 38 that we hear Jesus speak. And in his Jesus-like fashion, he begins with a question. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? If Jesus asked you that question, would you have an answer? The Gospel of John is the Gospel of the I Am statements. Jesus later says things like, I am the vine and you are the branches, or I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is going to surprise them again and again, and they just don't know what's in store for them. These students of John don't know how to respond, so, you know, perhaps in their excitement, what, all they can do is ask their own question. Rabbi, 
where are you staying? They don't know how to answer Jesus, but we do know that they want to abide with him, and they want to stay where he is staying. So what are you looking for? What are we looking for when we come to church? Hope, acceptance, love, justice, liberation, all of the above? Maybe the disciples of John were looking for the same thing. And when Jesus says, come and see, they follow him. They may not be able to name what they're looking for, but they see something in this anointed one, and they follow him. Jesus' invitation is one that crosses time and space. It's for the disciples of that time and place, and it is for us in this time and place. Each year during the season after Epiphany, the lectionary text invites us to remember that call. And, you know, we here at this church use the lectionary a lot. Um, and so we hear in cycles over throughout the years the same themes in January. To remember that call. To remember the early days of Jesus' ministry. And the people who changed course to follow him. And hopefully we take time during this time of year also to pause and to reflect and remember our own faith journeys and our own decisions to follow Jesus into the unknown. I was reminded this week by Reverend um, Lena Thompson from Lake Huron Presbyterian. As many of you know, I, I study with her and some other uh, pastors in the area. On Tuesdays, we crack open the Bible and, and talk about the text for the week. And, and she reminded me that um, even the greats like Martin Luther King Jr. had pivotal moments in their lives, epiphanies when making decisions, listening to the Holy Spirit as which path to take. It's often it's easier to say that we're going to go and see what Jesus has in store for us than actually going and doing it. Just going and doing the thing can sometimes be the hardest part. You, we're pretty good at talking a good talk, right? But walking the walk is harder. And sometimes we do need an epiphany or a push or a nudge or a shove to actually go and see what Jesus is calling us toward. And for someone like Dr. King, the decisions were high stakes. It wasn't just that his life was the life that would be affected by his choices. No, it was his family, his community, and what would become the wider civil rights movement. In his situation, holy curiosity was not trivial, but based in a profound need. There was a legacy of urgency in King's message that is deeply rooted in the urgency of Jesus' message. You could say it was even harder to stay open, maybe, and stay curious um, what the Holy Spirit had to offer you know, for King and for any of us when our backs are up against a wall. We can get tunnel vision. We can't always hear what the Spirit is trying to tell us. So here I draw from an article from the National Catholic Reporter from 2007 in which uh, the writer John Deere is reflecting on Dr. King's life. And I just put this in its entirety into my sermon today because it's, it's good. It's a good story. It's good for us to remember. He writes, believe it or not, King remained by and large reticent about his relationship with God, kept his prayer life to himself, except for one occasion, an astonishing visitation that occurred early on in his career and transformed his life. It was the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott. Rosa Parks had just been hauled to the police precinct for her, her audacity on the bus. And amid the electricity in the air, King emerged, the man of the hour, confident new leader who would take on racism and injustice and violence and surprisingly in a spirit of confident public nonviolence. at least by the outward look of things right privately however he started out as a reluctant prophet by all means he would help advance nonviolent change but to be thrust in the spotlight of national leadership that was another matter indeed on the other hand, an assumption mitigated the pressure. The boycott assumed everyone, including King, would last but a few days. 
symbolic victory achieved, and in short order, things would be put back to normal. A few days, however, became many and passed over into weeks and months, and the white people of Montgomery rightly discerned a bona fide economic threat. That's when the death threats began, chilling and cutting to the chase. Call off the boycott or die. Towards the end, as many as 40 such phone calls came in every day. Can you imagine getting 40 phone calls a day? And on one occasion, when the police had hauled Dr. King into jail for speeding, in the clutches of the police at last, he imagined himself on the threshold of being lynched. Fear descended like a fog. It reached an apex late Friday night, January 27, 1956. King slumped home, another long strategy session under his belt, and found Coretta asleep. He paced and he knocked about, his nerves still on edge. And presently the phone rang, a sneering voice on the other end. Leave Montgomery immediately if you have no wish to die. King's fear surged. He hung up the phone, walked to his kitchen, and with trembling hands put on a pot of coffee and sank into a chair at his kitchen table. Here is the prelude to King's most profound spiritual experience. He describes it in his book, Stride Toward Freedom. I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right. But now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced God before, says King. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. Three days later, a bomb blasted his house and his family escaped harm by a hair's breadth. Strangely enough, King later wrote, I accepted the words of a bombing calmly. My religious experience a few nights before had given me the strength to face it. Dr. King was a prophet, a pastor, a civil rights leader, and also he was just a man, a man at a kitchen table at his wit's end who decided to not go quietly away. He stayed present to God and God stayed present to him. He stayed open to God's work in him and God did indeed work through him, much to the chagrin of the status quo, AKA white America. One of the most important things we can do when we are hesitant or unsure, or even when we are bullheaded and ornery, is that we can call upon God to help us to have some holy curiosity. We can call upon God to meet us in the moment when we admit that we can't do what we are trying to do on our own. So when someone asks us to come and see, just how unsheltered families are getting by in Burien, we can open our eyes and take it in. And when someone else asks us to come and see what the food bank is up to and who they are serving or what hospitality house needs or the severe, sub, uh, severe weather shelter is doing, we are even more ready with open hearts to help and be of service. And here we go, this one's like really close to home. And if a church, let's say Normandy Park, United Church of Christ, um, says, hey, 
do we have any musicians out there that can play the ukulele or the harmonica or the guitar or the, the banjo or the piano? Uh, and if you're one of those people that can do those things, well, God might just be nudging you to share your talents in church because we are sure to need some musical talent and some help and fun once heaven meets us in the middle of February, February, and especially those last two Sundays in February. So, you know, maybe it's not quite as dire as making a decision of what to do to be a leader of a civil rights movement or not, but sometimes church music is, is important too. So yes, if someone, this is the other part that I want to speak about, about holy curiosity and, and about how we engage others. If someone has a story to share, um, we can make that choice when we are with that person to really listen and to ask good questions and hear what that person in front of us is saying. So imagine if Dr. King had had someone there in the middle of the night to talk with, to entertain that holy curiosity and be there with King in that moment. Those kinds of moments happen all the time, and, and we can sometimes be those people who listen with that holy openness to that other person in front of us. We don't need to formulate our answers while another person speaks. We don't need to be rushing ahead and with our facts and our figures and how smart we are. No, we can practice some holy curiosity in the moment and just listen and be present. One of my favorite writers to follow on Instagram is Shannon Martin, and she says that curiosity lights our way to compassion. I really like that. Staying open and staying curious means that we might just be transformed. It means that we will be ready when Jesus says, come and see, no matter how difficult that come and see might be for us. In our wonderings and in our wanderings and our faith, it serves us well to pause and to reflect and to have open-ended conversations with God and to keep our eyes and ears and hearts open to where God is calling to us. It is good for us to practice a sense of holy curiosity, and maybe even especially so in times when our feelings are charged, when our tempers are about to flare, and when we are scared or when we are worn out. God will meet us there. Just as John testified, just as Rosa Parks sat on that bus, just as Dr. King received that still small voice at his kitchen table, God will meet us where we are. And may God's holy curiosity cause us to follow when we receive our own invitation to come and see. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing, You Walk Along Our Shoreline.
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In sharing of our time, talent, and treasure, we have a lot of different things going on. Um, I don't know if anyone wants who wants to pop up first. Tawny? Just a quick um, announcement to let you know that there are four poinsettias from Christmas out here on the table, and there, anyone is welcome to take one or all of them, but they need a home where it's nice and warm. Couple of things to be, or quite a few things to be looking forward to. Um, the first is next Sunday. Lorraine is um, going to maybe tell us a little bit more about that, or not. I can do it. It's up to you. What do you want? Okay, you're coming on. <laughs> it's hard to hear it from the from the actual palliative care chaplain. <laughs> Just a quick um, reminder announcement. Um, next Sunday, 11:30 to one. So right after church. Um, Dying well, an open conversation about a good death. That's an invitation to have some conversation about what a good death means to you. Um, if you are coming, if you'd sign up on the sign up board or um, let uh, let them know in the church office that you're coming, there will be some sandwiches. And so we just need to know who's coming so we have enough food for everyone to eat. Um, and then following Saturday um, from 9 to 12, Moments of Peace, Finding Meaning and Hope, George Miranda Blake. Um, these are, that's just an opportunity to explore the spiritual aspects of dying and, um, and also about invitations to completing life and some conversation um, and some journaling, some, uh, just, just some exploration through conversation and being together. So hopefully you'll be able to come. Looking forward to being with you all in a different kind of way. So thanks. Thank you, Lorraine. I think it'll be really good, and you can invite your friends. You know, this isn't something that's just limited to NPUCC people only. I've already even thought about maybe we should put it on the conference Google group, but you and I can talk about that later, Lorraine, if you want to say anything to it. Um, so, um, also, we have coming up on the 24th, which is a Tuesday, we have two things. If you're interested in learning more about how to become a climate justice church and you have time at about 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, we're gonna have a Zoom conversation with Brooks um, Berndt, who is new UCC national staffer about um, climate justice. And then also that same afternoon, starting at 4.30, we're having a community meal and everyone's invited to come. And you can, of course, invite your friends to that also. We have a cadre of people that are helping with the meal, but if you want to volunteer or learn more about it, please talk to Alice, as um, she's helping coordinate that right now. I usually just hang out at the door as a greeter and say hi to everyone. And um, you know, there's we've got a couple of folks that come and play music, which is really cool. But they, they play some like Beatles tunes and stuff. It's really like your own private concert. It's kind of nice. <laughs> um, anything else you want to share this morning? Okay. Um, Remember that there's an offering plate towards the back of the room, and we're so grateful for all the ways that you give of your time and your talent and your treasure here at this church, and we will sing our offertory response. And we'll sing this through uh, three times, and the goal is eventually that we can do it as a round, so please join us. We thank you, Lord, for all your gifts of love, O oh Lord, for food, for friends, for life in your beautiful world. We thank you, Lord, for all your gifts of love, O oh Lord, for food, for friends, for life in your beautiful world. Once more, 
So friends, on this Sabbath day, I invite you to employ some holy curiosity, to not be afraid to ask the hard questions of yourself and of God and of those that you love, and to be present in the listening and to be open so that you might be transformed. May you know that God's love is here to transform you and shape you and mold you into being that follower of Jesus. So that when Jesus says, come and see, you're like, okay, we will come and we will see. Amen and amen.
Have a good day, all. Bye. There he goes. <laughs>